Well, thank you very much to everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here in the South Summit, and more pleasure being with a number of friends and very successful entrepreneurs. I think we're going to try to have an interesting discussion where we're going to drill into some of the mistakes that us as founders generally do on the process of building a unicorn. No? So since we don't have as much time as we would like, uh, we'll kick it off very quickly. You can, you can see the, the impressive resumes of everyone who we have here, so we're fortunate of that. Um, and, and I would like to open it up by asking, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you guys have made? Um, maybe, Sergio, you can start by talking in a more general sense, you know, dealing in a Brazilian market, you know, very volatile ecosystem. What are some of the mistakes that, that, that you've made that have helped you become stronger and then move on to build, you know, an amazing business? Great. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, so, yeah, many, many mistakes. I think that the, one of the key features of probably every single entrepreneur that I've met is that it's much tougher than what it looked like. And um, yeah, moving into a different geography, as Brazil in my case, they were like a very good thing. That is because nobody knows you. You are not afraid of failing. And uh, you're not afraid of your friends calling you and saying, what the hell did you do? Um, that, that, was, that was nice. Yeah, so that took out some of the pressure. I think you know, pressure is one of the things that entrepreneurs we need to suffer the most over a very long time frame. So I think I, I, you know, one of the, the, the one, a big advice is to make sure that you manage it properly. Um, but it, doing a proper, and it doesn't need to be very extended, but proper due diligence on the market that you're attacking, making sure that you understand a bit of it and you don't oversimplify, um, I think that that was like a big mistake. I, I knew financial services quite a lot. I had been working on that for 12 years before founding Creditas, but I really didn't know Brazil. And um, I was careful enough to talk to everyone that I was meeting and telling them about what I was trying to do and a lot of criticism about it. But I think that if I would have spent a bit more time in just explaining those stories more, I would have gotten feedback from everyone. I remember even your partner, Fabrice, uh, I was still living in New York and I was pitching him on the idea of building a marketplace for financial services. And uh, Fabrice was looking at me saying, yeah, yeah, that looks good. And I was, okay, this is going to be like a check very right on. And then at the end of the conversation, yeah, yeah, it's, I love it. That's why I invested in Capitalis. Uh, so that was like a, a, you know, a, a very easy uh, thing that you have to do as an entrepreneur. Know the audience that you're talking to uh, because that's going to save you like a lot of uh, bad things. Well, that's fantastic. And, and Luciano, uh, you guys have had a very interesting fundraising ride. And clearly, managing fundraising, cash flow, you know, and expectations in the market is, is probably one of the single most important things you need to do on the process of building a unicorn. So why you don't tell us some stories and learnings uh, and mistakes that you've made uh, through that? Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's very... Us, uh, we entrepreneurs, we are in love with our ideas, and um, we need to find people in love with our ideas as well. That's basically finding people, teams, and VCs, partners to be with you. This is one of the most hard, I think this is the hardest thing, because um, it's not just about the money, it's what you're going to do with the money, and uh, you and your team and your VCs need to find an agreement in in the usage of that certain money to grow specifically. Because, of course, we entrepreneurs we want to change the world. VCs want to see their money triple, 4x, and all that. So how to find the balance? And this is very interesting and very difficult. Because while we are working in the office, trying to you know, call, call users, seeing a product feature not working, uh, VCs are like, OK, my number is still not tripled. So what's going on? So to I think the biggest learning for me is to have a very, very close relationship with VCs, with your partners, very close. Uh, send like micro management reports to them so they can have a deeper view 
of the real time of what's going on, not to have a surprise three, four months later because, you know, th this is basically what I, what I see uh, my friends entrepreneurs doing, not getting investors involved, which is a big mistake. So this is one of the biggest learning for me. Yeah, and I mean, also the cycles, no? I mean, maybe tell us a little bit about that, how, how easy it is sometimes to raise capital and then how hard it becomes, and how does that play into the risk of building the business? Yeah, well, in this sen uh, sense, uh, Sergio was saying that when you, when you know your audience, when your audience, well, then again, First of all, we entrepreneurs, we are in love with our ideas. Second part is to have your users in love with your ideas. When you have your users going crazy with you, it's very easy to find money. That's very easy. Because it's not yourself talking about yourself. Innovation is creating value to others. Once you have that validation, once you have tons of downloads, uh, social proofs, you have a lot of people talking about you, that's basically one part of the product market fit. When you find product market fit, that means your users will die if you don't exist, that's pretty easy to find money, believe me. The hard, the hard thing is that at the beginning when you're trying to find uh, that fit, when you're trying to find the first downloads, uh, this is pretty tough. You, then again, you have to find partners who believe in your idea, not in the reality. Once you have a reality going on, you just need money to scale. That's a little easier. Once uh, you don't have that, you're still trying to validate yourself in the market, it's still to validate your brand, that's a bit tougher. So uh, that's two different things and two different approach to VCs. When you find like seed uh, investment, that's kind of easy for that stage. And then uh, different stages, different VCs as well. Oh, fantastic. And I think another very, very important uh, piece of how do you build a unicorn has to do with attracting and retaining the right people. And also it has to do with building the right environment and the right culture. So why you don't tell us, Tony, on your experience, you know, what have been some of the critical mistakes that you've made doing that and what are some of the learnings that you can share with the audience on what are the right things to think about this? Yeah, there are two mistakes that I made in my first unicorn that I was committed not to repeat in my second unicorn uh, when it comes to people and culture. Uh, the first one was about finding what I call uh, scalable uh, executive team is very early on. Now, in my first company, I hired people I knew uh, when I started the business in my executive team. They were awesome people, but they were fit for the first stage from zero to one. In my next company, current one, Oyster, I hired an executive search firm to help me to unbiase myself so that I don't make the same mistakes. And we went through a very thorough process to hire the first 10 executives that were fit not only for the first phase of the business zero to one, but could take us beyond that. Because what I learned is one of the major loss of opportunities in, in, in startups is you need to replenish your executive teams every two years. And, and therefore, you miss an opportunity. You have to restart from scratch. Uh, that's kind of the first mistake I made and, uh, and how I corrected it. Uh, the, the second one was around uh, mental health. I, after I finished my first uh, unicorn, we went public on the New York Stock Exchange, and I, I left the business, my coach came to me and said, you could have achieved the same level, if not more, success by burning yourself less and burning other people around you less. And that stuck with me. And I was committed in my next startup that I want to make sure to take care of my own mental health and make sure we create an environment where people uh, feel, feel great. How can we re reduce the stressors of work, unnecessary stressors of work on people? So you don't have to commute anymore. We create flexible work for you. You don't have to feel guilty if you want to go to the doctor at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, we reduce the amount of, um, uh, we, we create psychological safety by reducing reactivity by not reacting to bad news. Uh, we default to asynchronous work where people can process their emotions uh, on their own before coming into a meeting. We reduce the number of meetings. We, uh, we default to transparency, we build trust. So there's a, n a number of strategies that we use that create an environment that reduces the unnecessary stressors of people. And the result of that is massive amount of engagement and commitment and retention in the business. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that it is clear that as, as a CEO founder and 
uh, unicorn builder, there are so many things that you guys will have to deal with as you go through the ride. No, I mean, building the right culture, attracting and retaining the right people, understanding the volatility and the different nature of the stage at which you are operating, making sure that you find product market fit, and making sure that you can deal with complex dynamics in different circumstances in the market. No? So the next thing that I, that I think would be interesting to cover is how do you think about, is this an opportunity that can become a unicorn? What are some of the things that you guys did when you were thinking of building your businesses? And, and you know, I, I can say very clearly as, as, as a serial entrepreneur, having built a couple of unicorns as well, and as an investor, of course, there is the analytical framework that you generally use, which is, okay, how big is the market? How much is it growing? The competitive dynamics? Do I find a positioning differentiation into it? And of course, all of this is super important, but you also need to make sure that all of these squares, but that the idea or business that you're building is something you are passionate about. Because as an entrepreneur, if you are not passionate about the idea, you will find yourself so many times in holes. No? So um, with that, uh, Luciano, why, why you don't tell us how did you found product market fit and when did you know that you found product market fit? And then once you did that, how did you decide that it was the right time to scale? That's a great question because product market fit might seem um, easy to do, but I remember once we were at the Y Combinator school and uh, we had the same question, how, how can we do to find a product market fit? And the teacher at that time was like one uh, former Airbnb executive, it's like, well, if you're asking, you don't have it. So uh, yeah, we're asking, we don't know if we have it. So definitely you don't have product market fit then. So how to find it? So um, who tells you if your product works or not is your user. Not your developers, not the CEO, no one else. So talk to users a lot and make proper questions. One of the classic questions is like, how bad would you feel if I don't exist about regarding your product? So this is something we did a lot. I didn't just send like a, an online research. I actually called tons of users for a couple of months asking them, uh, why did you download my app? Why did you shop? Did you refer? If yes, why? If you didn't, why? Uh, what did you miss there? Uh, tons of different questions. And of course, if I don't exist, how would you feel? And at the beginning, ah, I'll just find another app. That's terrible, and that's not product market fit. You're just being there together with tons of competitors. Once we started to, to hear from those interviews, uh, well, please don't go away. If you go away, I won't save money, because the money I'm saving with you guys, I'm paying electrical bill. Voila. We heard that from one user. It was like, okay, we need to find more of those users. And then uh, I'm a marketing professional, so segmentation, I found a lot of those users, and I was actually targeting a different target audience, uh, a totally wrong one. The product was good, but wasn't good enough for that specific target. So once I hear, once I've heard, okay, this is, Perfect for me. Please don't go away, otherwise I'm gonna be, uh, you know, devastated. Okay, I need more of these guys. So that's basically talking to users. Like, no, don't don't stop. Never stop talking to your users once you find your audience, and then you triple that. Uh, be more assertive in terms of communication. That's basically that's how we fantastic. Find it. Thank you. Now, uh, one of the things that everybody talks about is that. As an investor, you need to invest in people that have the ability of figuring it out. Now, I can attest that figuring it out what Sergio did was quite of a challenge. So why you don't tell us what were some of the complexities that you were facing, you know, and, 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 why, and why did you decide you know, to build a business in such a complex space that now has become a unicorn, and whether you had in your head that this could be as big as it has become, you know, and, and, and how did you deal with some of this adversity? Jose, before jumping into that, just wanted to do like a quick amendment to this thing on the product market fit. Because you mentioned the marketing bias. I'm going to put like the financial bias as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, we always think that product market fit needs to come with great unit economics. Otherwise, it's just like uh, giving free money. I mean, you can find product market fit by taking bills of $1 and then selling them for 99 cents. 
people are going to love you, but at the end of the day, it's not very scalable. Unit economics don't get better with time. I mean, the marketing cost comes down because everyone wants to get to be working with you, but uh, regardless, it's not a great business. So always I would remember to bring also the financial approach to product market fit to validate it. I think it's related to, to the market component because one of the things that you really cannot change is the market that you select. It's, it's weird if you build a company and then after a year you say, well, I didn't like the market that much, let's change it. And instead of doing banking, let's do uh, food. Uh, typically, it doesn't work that way. So it's, it's very important to select the market properly and to make sure that you understand the dynamics, how they work. Um, when uh, I looked at the Brazilian market, it was a huge lending market, but it was extremely inefficient. Uh, um, and the inefficiency was very clear because the interest rates were very high, the spreads were massive, and uh, one thing that struck me was there was no asset back lending, so everything was unsecured. I don't know, it was like a, a very easy to see playbook. And then you were combining that with a tailwind that was uh, cell phones. That was 2012. And uh, even though in the US and Europe, uh, the, the iPhone was already booming, that was not happening in Latin America. So you, did, you, you were connecting both dots and saying, okay, I can build a digital platform to provide asset back lending to this population, lower the rates, and then have an unfair competitive advantage to, uh, to, the, banking, uh, to the banking incumbent. Now, obviously, easier, th easier said than done, because at the end of the day, you know that when you operate in banking, even though everything makes sense that you are saying, you need to fight a lot of regulatory complexities. You need to make sure that your customer understands that you're a trustable party. Um, you are going to be relying on capital markets, so it's not only that you are like a cool guy bringing in technology and fancy algorithms. You need to have good things that you have to offer to them. And uh, the paper had to be amazing so that the capital markets were actually buying you. You had to speak the language that, that, that you were, um, not, not only the Brazilian, the Portuguese language, but also uh, the language of the, of the bankers that were at the other side of the table. Um, so really things get ugly and complicated. And uh, many times I hear entrepreneurs saying, no, I mean, incumbents are extremely inefficient. Yes, it is true, but why is it that you're going to be the person actually that is uniquely positioned to solve this problem. Why? Do you have the resilience to actually make that happen? Because it's not going to be a, you know, one year and then something else. By the way, I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not a serial entrepreneur at all. I, I think it's so exhausting to build a business. You better select one that is great. And uh, I always say and, and joke about it that once and only once, never again will become an entrepreneur just because of the, all the complexities that you need to deal with. Uh, but anyways, just some learnings. Well, hopefully we create the right incentives for people to become entrepreneurs, no? It is very hard. It is very hard. And as you go through this process, you need to have the ability to figure it out because you are going to be finding things all the time that are not necessarily what you expect, no? And having that ability to, to see uh, you know, be resilient and at the same time be flexible, you know, readapt yourself on a day-to-day -day basis is kind of super important. Now, Tony, once you have built a business that found product market fit and that it's growing, what are some of the challenges that you faced doing that as you scale towards a unicorn? Yeah, so one of the uh, greatest challenge of all time that we faced was in the last two years. How do you move from uh, growth at all costs to efficient growth uh, we thought we were going to be a 10 times bigger company. So we were building for that goal, and suddenly the interest rates changed. So we had to uh, uh, break, we had to uh, push on the brakes, but uh, if you push too hard too early, then you're going to decelerate, and you're going to be irrelevant. If you don't push too hard enough, then you might make an accident right, and run out of money. So it was really the challenge was how do you find that balance? How do you find that balance? So we had to work on improving our financial uh, controls. How can you get more visibility into your financial? Instead of having visibility every quarter, can you get visibility every month? What needs to happen to increase that accuracy so you can actually steer the ship or the car in a much more fine, fine way? Uh, we had to well, keep, keep the culture uh, intact. Right? How do you make sure that this amazing culture that you've built, now that there's more stress, there's less resources, how do you keep these people engaged and motivated? Well, for us, it was, it was ensuring that we measure the burnout in the business. How can we measure that people are having a rough time? 
and how do we make corrective measure? The same way we're dealing with our financial, can we deal with how people are feeling in the business? Um, and um, what, what, what about uh, the, the, the situation where you know you have hired people that believe in you, you know, and, and they did an amazing job at the early stages of the business, and then suddenly you realize that you need to professionalize the company. How do you do? How did you deal with that? Yeah. So, uh, like, well, well, first, why not be professional from the beginning, right? Like, so you have to really build a solid foundation that enables you to not be in a position at some point where you have to professionalize a business. Like every quarter you're professionalizing a little bit more. It's something that you do in the long term, continuously work on. Um, and, and secondly is that you have to build businesses that are mission driven, that, are, that have a purpose beyond just making money. So you can attract people that are committed to the mission in the long term and they're not here just for a paycheck or for a career growth. There's something much more emotional that connects people to the business. And, and, and lastly, you have to believe in people's ability to change, right? People's behavior, uh, professional behavior, is, is actually not necessarily who they are, but a component of the, who they are plus the environment you're in. So you focus on, on, on professionalizing the environment, and you do it very slowly, very gradually, it's not like a flip of a switch. Yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, unfortunately, we are somewhat limited of time. But one of the things that I want to say is, as an entrepreneur, throughout your careers and life, you will always face a number of situations where you are very close to dying. No? And, and, I, and I can tell, or, or, or mistakes that are incredibly de 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 determinant, or decisions that are incredibly determinant on your future. When, when we were building the Remate, I, I, was, I was very young, and, and we were faced with the uh, uh, proposition of eBay of saying, hey, guys, we want to give you a business that has no revenue, that is m burning $2 million per month, um, you know, and we want 30% of your company. And yes, of course, my board told me, you are crazy. You need to go back and ask them for, um, you know, for, uh, for cash. You need to ask them for technology, for a certain level of commitment. They didn't want to do that. They turned around and they went with my competitor. And, and that decision made, you know, made us becoming the underdog. No? So there's very, very specific points in time. And I would love to hear from you guys in one of those situations. So maybe, Sergio, you can start. And then I would love to hear as a wrap-up from everyone else on this. I'm going to give you two very quick ones. One was in the early days, uh, three years into founding the company. We land an amazing contract with the largest bank in Brazil. We were a team of seven people after three years. By the way, you were scaling companies slower. And then uh, we land that contract. I hired 35 people. We do an amazing job for the bank. Four months later, prove them that we are doubling conversion rates in a specific channel. And then there's like a change in the management team of the bank. They fire us uh, the next Monday. Uh, so you become with a team of 35 people that they don't have like, anything to do. Uh, reinventing all those things. Very, very, very close to collapsing. And that was in the early days. Nothing would have happened. The second one is very public. Uh, and I think it's, a, at least from my perspective, very interesting story on learning how to adapt. Two years ago, uh, we were already a unicorn, $4.5 billion valuation. We were burning $20 million per month. So you were saying $2 million. I was burning $20 million per month. A, um, and we were getting ready to do 4x in 2022. Um, so uh, it, it was like a very tense conversation inside of the company on what was going to be the next steps. And, uh, and yep, everything was in favor of we don't have a plan. And uh, we just reinvented ourselves very quickly. Today we are a profitable company. So it's always like a, you know, a light at the end of the, of the tunnel. Um, but you need to keep resilient there. Well, that's great. Luciano. Sure. Uh, according to the second point here of Sergio, um, growth is growth. Growth is not marketing growth or volume or GMV. Growth is growth. And we took a little while to understand that because we were, as a marketing professional, I was growing with campaigns, with numbers, with volumes, with downloads, but we also have to growth have growth in technology, in people, in culture, in all areas of the company. And this one, we took a little while, maybe two years or three years to realize that we have to grow our unit economics. We have to grow our relationship with the market. We not only 
campaigns in GMV. And this, just to sum me up here, this is one of the biggest learnings we had. Growth is growth, not marketing, growth. Fantastic. Tony. A few years ago, I was reading a Series A for, for this company. And after one month of pitching, I was getting straight no's. No's, 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 no's from investors. I thought I had to shut down the business. And the more I get a no, my fear based on that thought would go up and up and up, and I was getting even more no's. So I couldn't sleep after one month. 4 a.m. in the morning, I wake up and I wrote a letter to myself. Everything that I need to do if I could not raise money. And I, I realized, actually, I can, I'll, I'll be fine. I'll be okay. I'm not going to die. And the next day, my mindset changed. And I was getting yes, 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 yes. And since then, I don't call it fundraising. I call it fun raising. Because if I'm having fun fundraising, then investors won't feel my fear. And since then, it's been a very successful journey to send through these Zoom screens this energy of fun and, and, and not fear. Well, guys, thank you very much. This has been fantastic to be able to share some of these thoughts. And thank you also to the audience for being here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.